Ladies and gentlemen, we have just 50 minutes to save the NHS. Please welcome to the stage your first NHS saviour, Dr. Phil Hammond! Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, gorgeous, lovely people. Welcome to 50 minutes to save the NHS. I was born in the NHS. How many people are born in the NHS? Yes. Born in the NHS, I was... Yes, I was born in the NHS. This will be interesting. Born before the NHS, I was born before the NHS. <laughs> Big round of applause over there. Wow. If you were born before the NHS, you'll, uh, you'll know what a marvel it was before the 5th of July 1948. We didn't have universal health care. People were frightened of calling the doctor. Overnight, we had universal care free at the front door, paid for out of universal taxation. And one of the reasons it's in trouble now, it's a victim of its own success. Uh, when it was started in 1948, half of us died uh, before the age of 65. Now, one in three people born today will live to the age of 100. Yeah. A person who lives to 150 may already have been born. I don't think it's you, sir. <laughs> don't be too disappointed. But the point is we are living longer and longer with diseases that uh, previously would have killed us. And that's one reason why we're slightly overloaded. Uh, we're streeting um, and the incoming Labour government have said the NHS is broken. If you think it's broken, say aye. Aye. If you think it can and should be fixed, say aye. Aye. And if you think Labour and West Streeting are the people to fix it, say aye. Aye. Oh, who can that be? Who can that be behind the curtain, I wonder? Could it be only the second woman in history to be both chair and president of the Royal College of GPs? GP for 40 years. She set up revolutionary clinics for addiction, for gambling addiction, and to help NHS and care workers with mental health issues. Please welcome to the stage the one and only five-star Dame Claire Gerrada. <laughs> You were like, you were like Eric Morgan coming out there. You've learned some comedy. I, I couldn't find the way out. How are you doing? What's your watch saying? Yeah, we always I, check Claire's vital I, signs I when she comes check, on. So my oxygen saturation was 100% again. Well, that's good. Let's yeah, have a look. Blood uh, pressure. No, my Two, 280 over 160. <laughs> Is that high? Is that high? What else have we got here? Anal tone, 97%. <laughs> Amazing what these watches do these days, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. So, so I, I decided to do this with Claire uh, because um, I don't know much about the uh, honours system. I write for private honour. I'm never going to get an honour. But I sort of assumed Claire would be great for, for comedy because I assumed as a dame she would have done lots of panto. <laughs> Turns out she's not that sort of dame. Why did you do this show with so me, Claire? He knows I'm not that sort of dame. So when I got the email, it was just before Christmas, mm. from Philip Hammond uh, to come and talk about the NHS at the Edinburgh Fringe, of course I said yes, thinking that he was the Tory MP, Philip Hammond. <laughs> and then... You said yes to boring old spreadsheet <laughs> yes, Phil? Yes, <laughs> So would you rather have done it with him or TV's Dr no, Phil? No, it's been fabulous doing it with you, Phil. It has been fabulous, yes. but we do have a slight legal requirement before we start. Claire and I both still registered with the GMC, only one of us still practising. Practices, but we need to know your resuscitation wishes should someone collapse in the audience today. <laughs> We've been watching you on the way in and we reckon one cold snap could wipe half of you out. <laughs> Or a heat wave. Uh, Claire, you've done some research. Have you found yeah, where the defibrillator is? I, I have. I've actually asked all the staff every single day whether they know where the defib is. And only one member of staff in over two weeks has known. And what's worse than having no defib is not knowing where the defib is. And I bet none of you noticed where it was. It's actually just down at the bottom of the stairs. Excellent. Well done. So let's just have a quick round of applause. Those uh, Someone was to collapse today. Uh, if you'd like either Claire or I to try to resuscitate, you say, Aye! Aye. Okay, and if you well, just want, oh, fuck it, leave me, let me die in the corner, say aye. Ooh, that's the most we've had. <laughs> it is. Now, here's a slightly trickier choice. Uh, I've been doing these shows since 1990, and during my time at the Fringe, 17 people have collapsed during my shows. Um, haven't been able to save one of them yet. <laughs> But you've had slightly more success with an out-of-hospital arrest, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, I had one uh, at Waterloo Station. A, a, a man collapsed and I did the full works. Okay. And Thomas is only across the road. So, yeah. Saved I, his life. I saved his life. Right. OK. Well, bearing that in... Yeah, so you can clap if you want to. <laughs> Not too much applause. That's how fascism started. <laughs> Arnold Brown. That's an Arnold Brown gag, by the way. So, slightly harder question for you now. So, in the event of your collapse, who would like TV's Dr. Phil to try and resuscitate them? Say, aye. 
who would like Professor Dean Claire Gerrada to try and resuscitate them say hey <laughs> shit every time thank every you time. <laughs> so let's now segue yes. effortlessly into assisted dying yes because this is a comedy programme this is a comedy programme now we're not suggesting that assisted dying is a good way to save the NHS that would be slightly mercenary <laughs> particularly there's a bloke in here reviewing it for the British Medical Journal um, however what we are saying is how many people here when they get towards the end of their life would like the opportunity to turn themselves off. Those in favour say aye. aye. And he would just say, no, leave me be. I want to go on as long as I can watching Cash in the Attic on a loop until I'm 147. Say aye. aye. And that's fine. Do you remember the good old days when we could agree to disagree in a slightly civil manner? Where, where do you stand on assisted dying, Claire? Yeah, I'm in favour of assisted dying. And I think we'll actually be the first generation that can choose the time and the place of our death. Okay, and uh, you've been involved in uh, negotiations in Jersey, haven't you? Yeah, I'm involved in Jersey Healthcare, and they've just uh, passed through their parliament to make assisted dying legal. It still has a way to go, but it will soon be available. So we won't actually have to fly to Switzerland, we can just go to Jersey? Uh, no, you have to live in Jersey for five years before you're eligible. Shit, okay. Uh, <laughs> if that doesn't kill you first. Um, anyone here from Jersey? No, uh, okay. Um, so. In the meantime, uh, we're all stocking up in our just-in-case drugs bag until we get assisted dying. Uh, who wants to know what's in Claire's just-in-case drugs bag, say I? Because we can't do dial morphine anymore because of shipment. What have you been stockpiling for your assisted death, Claire? Well, I've been stockpiling HRT cream. <laughs> <laughs> On the basis that if I sort of lather my entire body oh. with it, and then if you come to Phil's show this afternoon, he'll teach you how to pleasure yourself. And so what more fabulous way to go than with an orgasm? You die with an orgasm. Those in favour of dying with an orgasm, say hey. <laughs> Has there actually been a randomised control trial of this, Claire? Any proof? Not yet. I've put a grant application in. <laughs> and I'm looking for recruits on the way out. So anybody wants to sign up? I'm definitely signing up. I, I'm like, can you accept men? Because I, as a man, I want to die moist. Who wants to die moist? Say hey. <laughs> You, you, you do actually, everybody dies wet. Do they? We, yeah, we all die wet. We, well, because at the end of life, when you've just died, yes. you excrete bodily fluids. So right. uh, poo, pee and saliva. This yeah, is a comedy com programme, I promise comedy you. Show. <laughs> right, so even if you haven't peed, peed, eaten anything yes. for ages, you do a pee yes. and a poo when you die. Yes, yes. I didn't know that. Yeah, well, now you know, if you've ever been around somebody... Everybody would... dies wet. Wasn't that a B-side for REM? <laughs> Uh, so I've been stockpiling uh, hallucinogenic mushrooms. Uh, I've decided when I die, I want the works. I want mushrooms, uh, I want some cocaine, I want some heroin. I want one of those virtual reality headsets that makes me think I'm in Acapulco and I want to listen to the Pet Shop Boys. Uh, those in favour of going out with a bang, say it! Well, I think we should be able to do that, do you not? Yeah, I do, absolutely. The reason actually, seriously, uh, I'm uh, in favour of assisted dying is that, uh, like many people here, I guess, uh, I've had to uh, nurse uh, a relative at the end of life and it's just gone on a bit too long. Anyone been in that situation? Yeah, and it does, doesn't it? And it happened to... I've, if you've been to see my previous shows, you'll know that I've had two dads. Uh, my first dad, Barry, very sadly t uh, took his life at 38. Uh, and then I was really lucky to have a second dad, Stan, who was a West Country builder. And he was just the best stepdad in the world. He used to, used to go to Steve and I, uh, do what you're good at, do what you enjoy, and try to be a decent man. Isn't that lovely advice? If every young man had a parent like Stan, I'll tell you, we'd be in a much better place now. We wouldn't have that hate and violence and riots and stuff. Though those in favour of Stan-style parenting say, hey! Aye. Stan, rather sadly, got uh, pancreatic cancer, and we know that, you know, Steve Jobs couldn't even buy his way out of that one. Uh, and we nursed him home. He had lovely uh, palliative care team. It was all fine, but because he was so fit, he just went on and on and on. Six to eight weeks of really unpleasant, low-quality living. And he pleaded with me for, for, to speed it up. And, of course, I couldn't. All I could do was do a show about it. So I did a show about it, and I performed at the Pretty Folk Festival. And this farmer came up to the afterwards, and he said, Dr. Fell, I heard what you said about your stepfather, Fa uh, Stan. And that rang bells with me, because that's what happened to my father. He was a farmer. He was tough as old boots. He got cancer. It took him ages to die. He went on and on and on. He was just a dry old husk of a man at the end. And we thought, that is not humane. That is not happening in our family ever again. So we got together, one big family, farming family. We got around the conference table. And we came up with this ideal that we call Kling Film Assisted Suicide. <laughs> I said, what does that involve? He said, when people are close to the end of death, not, not before that, when they're close to the end of death, what we do is we wrap them lightly in a sheet of cling film. If they want to pull it off, they can, or they can just leave it be and die that bit quicker. Uh, we've seen off three members of our family like that, and it wasn't picked up at the post-mortem. 
So those in favour of clean film assisted suicide say aye. Uh, Where do you stand on well, that, Claire? Ladies and gentlemen, I certainly wouldn't try that one at home. Can you reuse the cling film, uh, Phil? I think you can if it's from Retros, but from what you said, it'd be quite wet, wouldn't it, <laughs> yes, if you died wet? Yes. You'd have to wring it out first and then reuse it. Which would be quite difficult. Comedy show. Should we move on? <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, what we were hoping to do, my uh, friend Dame Claire Gerrada, who apparently is politically very well connected, assured me that the election was going to be in the autumn. Uh, so if you look in your Fringe programme, it describes this as the perfect pre-election warm-up. Anyone spot that? <laughs> So what we were going to do is we were going to go around the country, we were going to collect ideas to save the NHS, we were going to add our own, we were going to present them to the various parties, and we were hoping one or two of them might make it into the King's Speech. We're a bit late for that, but we've got to carry on with the show anyway, because you've all bought tickets. Uh, this was the first suggestion we had from uh, Margaret McCartney, who's a GP in Glasgow, a friend of both of ours. This is uh, her suggestion to fix the NHS. All government departments, but especially the Department of Health and Social Care, should have an anti-bollocksology unit in it, <laughs> staffed by a broad range of experts who scrutinise all political reforms and block the ones that are bollocks. Those in favour say aye. aye. What's the biggest bollocks reform you've come across, sir? Yeah. <laughs> I think the 2012 NHS Act, which was actually called the Lansley Act, as yeah. so some of you remember, only England. And what happened was Andrew Lansley, who'd just come in, having promised no top-down reform, reform, uh, basically did the biggest reform, and I use that word lightly, that has ever happened in the NHS, so big you could see it from outer space, and uh, he literally got a hammer and smashed the health service, smashed ed medical education, smashed public health England, and basically we're still living with the consequences now. Do you think it affected our pandemic management? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, it built in competition right into the heart of the NHS. Of course, the pandemic management had to have cooperation. Rather sensibly, they didn't have it in Scotland. How many people here from Scotland say aye? aye. Anyone from England say aye? aye? Anyone from Northern Ireland say aye? aye. Excellent, aye. welcome. That's Anyone nice. from Wales say aye? aye? Anyone here from outside the NHS just come to laugh at our health service say aye? aye. But where are you from? <laughs> where are you from? Bristol. Bristol. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we move on? <laughs> That's NFB normal for Bristol. That is well known. Mate. Beautiful. Outside the NHS. Lovely. It is interesting because in Bristol they've outsourced 75% of their cataract operations to the private sector. So 75% of NHS cataract operations get done privately. So you could argue that bits of Bristol are outside the NHS, but we're going to move on. I want to know really why the election was early, because it just really confused me, because that tiny little wee bloke who used to be Prime Minister, what's his name? The, the one who called it early, he took over from the, like, the mad woman with the blonde hair, who couldn't outlast a lettuce, and she took over from that great big posh bloke who was like a Catherine Wheel of sperm and lies, remember him? Yeah, I, <laughs> what was his name? What was his, I, I, I forgot, I, I, it's all gone. what was his name? I, I, I can't remember. What was his name? I can't remember. The only one I can remember is uh, the one that caught was got caught with his pants down in uh, the Ooh. Department of Health. Matt, Matt, that was it, Matt Hancock. Yeah, I think for legal reasons, and particularly as this is being filmed and the bloke from the BMJ is here, we ought to say he wasn't actually caught with his pants down. Okay. He was having a consensual clinch with hands on. With, <laughs> with, but there weren't actually pants down. Right, Can you just rephrase I'll, that for I'll me, Claire? That. It was the one that got caught having a consensual clinch yes. with his pants on. Okay. And uh, his name, I won't repeat his name, but I have worked, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, in Richmond House which is the Department of Health, yeah. and it is the most unromantic place you could ever, ever find yourself. So the idea, and it's got CCTV cameras everywhere, so the idea that you could have a romantic affair in that building just beggars belief. Have you actually. not had a romantic clinch in there? Uh, no, I haven't. Not even with Jeremy Hunt, your friend Jeremy Hunt? You and Jezza? Little clinch? You're no. laughing, you're laughing. What are you hiding? Why are you laughing then, Claire? <laughs> Is that a guilty smile? It's a guilty smile. It's not a guilty smile. I have never had a romantic... He's a bit tall. He probably would have had to lean over a bit, wouldn't he? <laughs> You're just jealous. I am just jealous. I have actually met Jeremy Hunt. Uh, well, I don't meet many of the health secretaries. Claire meets them all. But he invited me because he knew that I wrote for Private Eye and I specialised in whistleblowing. And when he first came in, he invited me up to the Department of Health to meet him. And I, you don't, but I find Jeremy Hunt quite scary because he looks a bit like me without my glasses. He's got those slightly scary, close-together Weasley eyes, hasn't he? And it's a bit... Do you not find him a bit scary? <laughs> no. no. Anyway, uh, I got inside Richmond House uh, and my bowels got the better of me and uh, I needed to use the toilet and I was squatting down on trap number five, <laughs> dropping the kids off at the pool. That's a medical term. And there was a bit of graffiti at eye level and it said, there are 2,000 people working in the Department of Health. At this precise moment, you're the only one who knows what he's doing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Do you think that's fair enough? Top-down reform doesn't work. You can't control something as complex as health from the top down. What we need is a B-Day revolution from the bottom up. Do you not think? Uh, absolutely. So what, how would you do that though? So say, because Rachel Reeves, very helpfully, has said there's no more money either. So if we start with the existing envelope of money in the NHS, could we transfer, for, uh, transfer some of it into the community? Would it make a difference? Oh, it'd make a phenomenal difference. So at the moment, uh, I'm a GP and GPs do about 80% of all activity in the NHS for around about 6% of the budget. And we have to start shifting that resource away from hospitals into primary and community care because there isn't going to be any new money. And actually, if we do that, we'll deliver more health care with better outcomes and at a cheaper, cheaper cost. Is there good evidence that if you invest in primary care, you get better health outcomes? Oh, there's phenomenal evidence for around 70 years. There's, there's been unbelievable evidence that if you have m the more GPs you have per head of population, the better the outcome. And uh, I used to have a little prop, an apple, but Phil, Phil ate it. I've left your apple behind. No, Phil ate it, and uh, it's probably going rotten. <laughs> but uh, an apple costs about 30p, uh -huh. unless it's an organic apple, which case it's about 80p. Yeah, too much and information, Claire. Too much information. And the, it's 30p a day is what a GP get really? to look after someone for yes for the whole year so 30p per day per patient per year which just isn't enough an money. apple a day is what the doctor gets paid an apple a day is what the doctor gets paid That's so, ridiculous. so you can see why probably many of you can't get appointments with your gp why there's long queues etc etc so those in favor of taking say four percent out of the existing budget and shifting it into primary care say aye Oh, they like you on that They one. like it. So this is a bit on voting re reform, which I quite like. MPs who don't support proportional representation should have the proportion of their body removed that people didn't vote for. Those in favour say oh. <laughs> You think you want that, but do you really? Because we're quite balanced, aren't we, and politically yes. neutral. As, your, as we are. In your red jacket and mates with West Streeting. We're very politically neutral. <laughs> Anyone who supports proportional representation should be forced to spend the next five years in a bottomless pit with only 92 reform MPs for company. It's not so good now, is it? You think you want it, but that's what we yes, would have had. That is, you know, I used to be in favour of PR till this election. Yeah. And actually, this election, when you see how, how intelligent the electorate were in, in doing a tactical voting. It, and we've got a, I think we've got a, a government that's actually going to be able to deliver change rather than chaos. Do you think having decent, compassionate people in charge who tell the truth, will that make a difference? <laughs> <laughs> the... Uh, <laughs> Phil, I do. The NHS has always done better uh, under a Labour government. And this isn't apolitical. It is apolitical. It was going to be before the election. So as you see, we had to be neutral. Yeah. But it has always done better. I have slight concerns, if I might say, that having such a large majority on 34.7% of a 60% turnout is a bit dodge. And I remember Labour last time, who I think did really good stuff in trying to reduce child poverty. But when it started to go wrong, they adopted a slightly bullying, Stalinist, hit your targets approach. So actually, I think probably we do need a, a decent uh, opposition. But here is my uh, suggestion to fix the NHS. I think, because I'm half Australian, voting should be compulsory. But also, I think there should be a none of the above option. And in any constituency, if none of the above wins, then you don't have an MP. You spend all the money you would have wasted on an MP and all that back office stuff and all the ridiculous expenses on a community park in the middle of the constituency. And I bet that constituency will have better public health outcomes at the end of the term than one that had MPs. Uh, those in favour say aye. Interesting. And also, if none of the above won the entire election, the whole of the UK would be a community park. Those in favour say aye. What do you reckon, Claire? I think you're taking a cheap uh, shot at MPs. Ooh. I think they do a really good job. Most MPs really? do a really, really good job. They're committed to their local communities. And actually, I think, uh, yeah, they do a good job. Uh, those who think most MPs do a really good job committed to their local communities say aye. Oh, hey. not, <laughs> not the most resounding one you've had, Claire, but there we go. I particularly like this. The Spectator hated this one. Two days ago. <laughs> People who shelter their money in tax havens can still order an emergency ambulance, but it has to come from the Cayman Islands. <laughs> <laughs> Those in favour say aye! There you are. Bloody lefty audience, bloody lefty windows. Lefty, and I, and I, my comment to that is it would probably come quicker. <laughs> Get in there, get in there. <laughs> Gerard are doing the gags now. Um, it's odd, isn't it, that we think in this country we really demand first-class public services and yet we're not prepared to pay the taxes for them. How can we encourage people to pay more tax, do you think, Claire? Well, I think we should take pride in the fact that we can pay tax, that we, can, we earn enough money to pay tax to support others who can't pay so tax. So it's a badge of honour for living yes. in a civilised society. So yes. how about we have tax pride marches? You go on a tax pride march and you actually wear your tax return on your T-shirt. Those in favour of that say, hey! 
Oh, okay, we're nearly getting there. I don't think they like that one so much. Well, I don't know. There's a few tax dockers in there, I can, you know. <laughs> socialists, champagne socialists, we all are. Okay. All members of the cabinet and the medical regulators should be treated in the worst performing hospital in the country. Those in favour say aye. <laughs> Where do you stand on the Care Quality Commission? Because rather sensibly, they don't have it in Scotland. No. But the oh, CQC, does it give us value for money? I don't think it gives us value oh, for you. money at all. <laughs> we spend, with on costs, about a billion pounds a year when you take in all the costs. And what, what do they tell you? They tell you what you already know, which is your building's falling down, you can't get the staff uh, to, to manage the services you want to, and you're paying patients don't get the care that they need to get so and for that we spend vast sums of money is there any evidence that it improves care no there certainly isn't there is evidence for inspection and that it's mainly around very very narrow areas such as pathology where you've got an absolute number that you can measure something against but to, to have an inspection on something as complex as a hospital or even a gp practice no and it takes months to prepare it doesn't it? it takes three people a year to prepare or something ridiculous. well the average gp we we employ somebody full time all really? the time just what, to, prepare. to prepare for the CQC. <laughs> to prepare for CQC. CQC. But your hospitals will also have teams that are there full time just preparing for CQC. So those in favour of taking the billion pounds off the CQC, all cost told, and giving it to something else, say hey! So what I would suggest, and most of the useful things I've done in private eye over the years have relied on very brave NHS whistleblowers, uh, starting with uh, Steve Bolson, who was an anaesthetist in Bristol, who told me far too many, many babies were dying or suffering brain damage after heart surgery. That led to the Bristol Heart Inquiry, and just about all the big stories I've done have involved whistleblowers. The trouble is, almost invariably, we take the whistleblowers out the back of the hospital and shoot them, whether they're doctors, nurses, care workers, even patients and relatives. So I say we take some of the CQC money, we have an office for the whistleblowers, Whistleblower. A, it gives the whistleblowers decent legal protection immediately, and also it investigates their concerns promptly. Those in favour say aye. aye. Excellent. What would you do with your share of the CQC well, I, money? I, I think I'd invest in an office for the health and well-being of the health and care staff, because if we don't look after the staff that are meant to look after us, we're not going to get anywhere. Well done. <laughs> As we're in Scotland, if we don't mention the fact that Scotland is different to England, so A, they don't have a CQC, no. and they've done something rather fabulous, well, haven't they? Scotland has, I don't know whether many of you know, have actually eliminated new cases of cervical cancer. I mean, that, you know, this was something that's happened very recently. Yeah, give First it a country note. in the world? First country in the world. And that is an amazing achievement if you think about the distress that cervical cancer causes. Yes, indeed. And uh, they've done it with the HPV vaccination, and we use the quadrivalent HPV vaccination, which also dramatically reduces genital warts. Anyone here had genital warts, say I? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I've been in clinic, I've seen genital warts like a florid of broccoli, and it, uh, no, it absolutely destroys your life. So, those in favour of eliminating genital warts too, say I! <laughs> Doesn't get the publicity it deserves, genital warts, I'll tell you. No, well, talking of which, what, what? is that little, uh, little uh, ribbon you've got on your... Ah, well, my little ribbon. You know when you're a really famous celebrity, um, you get asked to be a patron of a charity. So you are Doctors in Distress. Yes. That little bugger, Adam Kay, I nurtured him along his career. He's ex accelerated up the inside. He's now playing far bigger venues I could only dream of while I'm playing a mid-sized student venue after 34 years. But we're not bitter. Anyway, he is also... Um, <laughs> Doctors in distress. Doctors in distress. Camilla, Queen Camilla, she is... I think she's osteoporosis, isn't she? She's osteoporosis, <laughs> and uh, Madonna is breast cancer. Guess what my charity is? Hmm? Bowel cancer. Those Herpes things. Viruses Association is mine. <laughs> and along the lines of genital warts is that because we don't talk about this stuff, um, it, it, it's really stigmatising. So I used to work in sexual health uh, clinic in Bristol. You'll remember this, sir. Bloke from Bristol. <laughs> It was part of the NHS, but you'd be struggled to find it because it was a porter cabin on top of a plague pit round the back of the eye hospital. And the reason it was there is because we, we don't talk about sex, it doesn't get on the front page of the Daily Mail, it doesn't get the funding, but it had the most amazing staff who would destigmatize uh, ill uh, diseases. We used to call them sexually shared infections rather than transmitted. And herpes was one of the worst. It's only a cold sore gone south. It's chickenpox on your knob. It really isn't pleasant first time round, but subsequent infections, if you get a cyclophera, are fine and you have an understanding standing partner, you can have sex, you can have children, etc. But people take their lives with herpes. Why does that happen? It's because the, the drug company that made acyclovir wanted everyone to take it. So on the front of Time magazine, there was this huge ad advert saying uh, herpes is the new leprosy. Herpes is forever. And people with herpes took their lives. So well done, the Herpes Viruses Association, for destigmatizing herpes. Give them a big round of applause. Right.
tell us about your charity, Claire. Yeah, my, my charity is Doctors in Distress, which is a charity that aims to reduce the rate of suicide amongst all health professionals by providing them with spaces where they can come together to talk about the emotional impact of their work. And I would just like to thank all of you here, because all the profits from our two-week uh, stint at the Fringe are going to Doctors in Distress. So thank you so much for contributing. <laughs> Now, it's time for the quiz competition. We always like the quiz competition in this. So which of the two lovely people on stage do you think used to smoke 40 cigarettes a day and on a bad day, sometimes 80? Uh, if you think it was Dr. Phil, say Dr. Phil. And if you think it was nicotinic Dame Claire Gerrada, say Dame Claire Gerrada. Oh, they've slightly sussed you out. How on earth did you manage to smoke so many cigarettes, Claire? Um, and how old did you start? Well, I actually started when I was eight years old by picking up my father's dog ends. But I then gave up uh, and restarted when I was 16. And uh, for the usual reason, a lot of young girls start, which is I fancied these three boys. And these three boys all smoked. So I asked them to teach me how to smoke, which they did. And 30 years later, I wow. was still smoking. It was, it's one of the most addictive drugs you can get. Didn't your dad, as a GP, used to smoke in the surgery? Yeah, I mean, in those days, so he used to smoke with his patients in the consulting room. He was a GP. I used to smoke uh, number six and Embassy Red. Any of you remember those? With the patients uh, as they were waiting to see him. Now, his dad got uh, reported to the Peterborough Evening Standard and was put on the front page. So he stopped after that. But it took me many, many decades for, I, for me to stop. And how how did you manage to stop? What was your uh, Yeah, I mean, I read this book by somebody called Alan Carr, who used to smoke 80 cigarettes a day. And before he died, and he died of a smoking-related illness, he left a real gift, which was this book on how to stop. And uh, it's a fabulous book. You can still get it. But the one thing I learned from that book was not to make it a red-letter day. Every time, every New Year's Eve, I'd throw my cigarettes in the Thames. Every birthday, I'd give up only to buy them the next day. But he says, don't make it a red-letter day. Don't put a cross in the diary. Don't tell anybody. Just stop and he gives you some hints how to do it and so that to me reframed my thinking of smoking as something that isn't special that you just give it up and do you think because you're a smoker did that make you interested in working in addiction services because you've worked yes. in just about every addiction and the thing that I noticed when I interviewed you for my Radio 4 programme uh, Doctor Doctor available on BBC Sounds uh, <laughs> is that A, you loved your job, but yes. B, you told me that gambling was the, the worst addiction yeah. you've come across. Why is that so bad? Yeah, they're, they're all pretty grim, but gambling is, number one, it's, I think, the most stigmatised. People think it's a lifestyle issue, but also you can destroy not just your life or even your children's life, but your grandchildren and your unborn great-grandchildren in the course of a, of a few hours. You can literally gamble away your life savings in a very short period of time. Because you said if you've got, like, six screens open online, you can get rid of £200,000 in half an hour. Can you? Well, you can, and wow. most people with problems with gambling have wow. many screens open. And uh, because I've been here, I've been watching uh, lots of you know daytime TV. There's so much adverts around gambling that make it sound like it's fun. Now, of course, it is fun. But if you're spending more time or money or you know somebody uh, on gambling, then please seek help. Because it is also the most treatable of all the addictions. OK, what should people do if they have well, a habit? Just Google Gamble Aware and okay. it will direct you. So tell us, how many people here think that we have a personal responsibility to stay as healthy as we can, not just to have decent lives, but to take the pressure off the NHS, say aye? aye. Okay, what do you do, Claire, to stay healthy? Because now you've, you've kicked your smoking habit and you look amazing. Well, what I, do you do? I, well, I don't drink. Right. Uh, before you, 11, that is. You do. <laughs> Claire, I should say, has two large glasses of Pinot Grigio before she comes on stage, but let's not go there. I, I, I do uh, goblet squats. Does anybody do them? Goblet squats? Goblet squats. Goblet, goblet. You sort of carry a weight and okay. just go up and down. It's very, very good for pelvic tone. Is it? Yes. Is that why your anal tone is 97%? <laughs> He's just jealous. I'm doing it. No, I do these, but I do them as a tribute to my old mate, Michael Mosley. He was very into these and a, a very into press-ups. I still find that when I do my squats, I do get a little escape of gas on the upstroke. Anyone get that? <laughs> Presumably you don't, because you've all tightened up there. Yeah, yeah. Does it sort out dribbling? <laughs> Are you dribbling anymore or not? I'm not dribbling anymore. Not it, do, it does sort out dribbling, actually. My, it, sorts out, it sorts out micturition problems. OK, my lovely, lovely wife, Jo, is a GP, been married for 32 years, and she lets me come up to the fringe, and I love her to pieces for that. But she says, Phil, please will you not wear your light-coloured chinos this year? Because at 62, I've just noticed, just occasionally, you do suffer from a little bit of post-micturition dribble. Anyone else do that? <laughs> If you're not sure what it is, as my auntie Queenie used to say, she used to go, Phillip, no matter how much you shake your pig, 
the last little drop goes down your leg. Um, <laughs> However, I've discovered with my dark coloured chinos, I can absolutely piss myself on stage. Nobody knows. I'm so wet now, I could be dead. <laughs> so I, I've been living with him for the last two weeks. I've been having to wash his clothes. You have. Thanks, Mum. Thanks, Mum. It's been lovely and it's been a slice of the good times, Claire. But let's move on. <laughs> This suggestion came from a nurse who's worked in the NHS for 50 years. We should write shit happens above, above every hospital entrance and GP surgery, every dental practice and every care home, so people arrive with realistic expectations. <laughs> Those in favour say hey! Hi. I like that one. Yes. Well, I mean, you're absolutely right. It is amazing how the health service is the only part of anything we use that we expect zero error. It is, isn't it? But actually, a lot of the shit happens before you get there, don't you? It's interesting, isn't it, that it's not really a national health service. People say it's a national illness service. I would argue it's a national shit happen service. And every person I've ever met living in a shit house has had shit health. You know, most of how much of our health would you say is, is socially determined? About 80% of our health right. is socially determined. So that's what you eat, where you live, what the environment is, how your parents that you've chosen. So it's, it's only 20% is what we do to you. So we need to move from a national uh, health service to a national uh, shit prevention service. Those in favour say aye. aye. And this is interesting. This comes from my Australian dentist, who I particularly admire. He says, only clean the teeth you want to keep. <laughs> Why does that matter? It matters because 100%, almost 100% of dental disease is preventable. And yet, what is the commonest operation in young children? It's having all their teeth, rotten teeth, removed under general anaesthetic. How are we going to stop that, Claire? Well, it is appalling. And remember, health begins in the mouth. Uh, well, we've had an obliteration of NHS dentistry. We, we don't have Sure Start or health visits anymore, so we have to reinstate those. And what about the corporate determinants of health? Because we know that shaming people doesn't work. You've shamed people for being poor, for being fat, or eating sugary foods. It doesn't work. How about, in the same way we've gone after smoking, we go after commercial food chains? I like this suggestion. Uh, to improve the nutritional content of food, the bosses of supermarkets and corporate food chains and restaurants can only eat a random selection of the food sold in their establishments. Those in favour say aye. aye. That might work. It might might work. You could eat. Yeah, but, but bear in mind uh, that a Big Mac uh, is a balanced diet. Uh, as long as you eat the gherkin <laughs> and as long as you eat the cardboard box that it comes in. Is that the roughage? That's the roughage. Okay, you heard it, you heard it here first. Uh, I particularly like this one too. Chief executives of water companies who pump raw sewage into our rivers and oceans should be obliged to bathe in it and then drink it. Those in favour say aye. <laughs> Disposable vapes should be disposed of on the lawns of the bosses who make them. Those in favour say aye. <laughs> People should choose between paying a carbon tax or breathing the air in Port Talbot. Those in favour say aye. <laughs> The air in Port Talbot is apparently very it, bad. Did you know that? No, I didn't know it. I know the, the air in Greenwich is, but not Port Talbot. Uh, this is one because you wanted us to big up some political achievements. And yes, here's one so just yes. for you because you love politicians. <laughs> People are living too long. We should celebrate the fact that the Conservatives managed to reduce life expectancy across the board. <laughs> Extraordinary achievement in every age group. That's never been done before. Well, How did they do that, Claire? It is an amazing achievement that for the first time since 1945, people, the it's life funny, expectancy has funny. dropped. Why, how did they do it, though? I mean, what was oh, the secret, do you think? The secret is not investing in the health service, not investing in those determinants of health, like good housing. Which do you think Open was the most damaging? So you didn't like the Lansley reforms of 2012, but we've also had, uh, obviously, Brexit, and we've had pandemic management. Which of those three things do you think killed the most people? I, I think Brexit has really? indirectly killed more, more people. More than the pandemic? Yes, I think uh, it's anybody who work in the health service. We can't get the medicines, we can't get the staff. Also, the, the economy has plummeted, and that affects all of our health and it also affected how we dealt with the pandemic so I think Brexit. I like this one for a bit of balance. Bashing the NHS is like hitting a watermelon with a sledgehammer. We need to celebrate its successes too or it will disappear under the weight of despair. Those in favour say aye. Tell us some good things well, the NHS is doing, Claire. I mean, the, the NHS was built at a time of hope and community, and it still does that. It's still full of hope. The only problem is we expect it to do too much. We expect it to boil the ocean, to, to sort out all the, the social determinants. But the NHS delivers 1.3 million uh, patients per day are seeing it. It delivers the first meningococcal vaccine, the first COVID vaccine, as I said, it, the uh, abolition of cervical cancer. So it does a phenomenal amount. OK, we need to remember that. This is one from your... Uh, husband Simon, remember him? I don't know. I <laughs> haven't seen him for a while. No, you haven't, have you? No. Turn the school run into an actual school run. Those in favour say aye. 
<laughs> I really like that idea. And obviously, we'd have to stop the delivery drivers and the four by fours knocking the kids over, but it could work. Uh, what did you suggest to Blair and Brown all those years yeah, ago? Many moons ago, I suggested that on a child's 14th birthday, that they bought them. We bought them a bicycle on the state. On the basis they'd be able to exercise, roads would be safer, and actually they'd stop stealing my bike. <laughs> so those in favour of bikes for all 14-year-olds who don't already have a bike, say it. We like this one. This is men's health we're moving into now. Dangerous territory. Anyone who doesn't wash their hands after going to the toilet, usually a man, should have poo fingers tattooed on their fingers. Those in favour say aye. What do you reckon? What is it about men that take disgusting risks, Claire? Yeah, I've just had this picture of the king reading that one out in the king's speech. <laughs> Anyone I mean, men want. do take more risks. They also, and here is a very sexist comment coming up, they do better when they're married uh, to women, whether or not they're in a happy or an unhappy marriage, whereas actually for women it isn't the same. So we, we, you need Have us. you told Simon this? <laughs> he knows. <laughs> 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 Sorry, C can we edit that bit out? Yeah. She's the one who, before it goes out. Okay, I think it's true though, isn't it? I mean, women are the ones generally. I have so many patients, male patients I've mm -hmm. seen, who come in with a lump in their testicle because their partner has said, or central crushing chest pain going down your left arm. Yes. You should get that sorted out. Okay, this from the Green Party. Plant trees and charge people to look at them. A forest that pays is a forest that stays. Isn't that nice? How many people here have decent access to green space? It gives yes. you so much health, it does, doesn't it? Yes. And yet we live in these big boxes and don't go out and enjoy it as much. How many people think we spend too much time staring at our screens rather than enjoying the green space around us? Yes. Do you think our children do that? Yes. Well, this is going to change your life. This is absolute genius. Turn the internet off at midnight unless you're using it to save lives or you really need a wank. <laughs> <laughs> Those in favour say aye. What do you think of the internet? Do you think it's a force for evil, Claire, or do you think it's got some useful bits well, it's, it? it's a balance, isn't it? I mean, the internet saved our lives during the pandemic. How on earth would we communicate with our loved ones? How would children have been educated? So it is a balance. I mean, there's a lot of shit on the internet as well, but... Uh, there is. Yes. What have you seen that's shit recently? <laughs> Moving on. Um, <laughs> here's how to solve the social care crisis. People should be legally entitled to live with their children for as long as their children live with them. Those in favour say aye. That would sort it out very quickly, wouldn't it? Yes. Now, you're big on waste. So one of the reasons you think we should transfer money into primary care is that in primary care we do fewer investigations, etc. Somebody suggested we should only be allowed to take five tablets a day maximum. Those in favour say aye. I mean, in the old days, we said any more than five, they start interacting with each other. Yeah, absolutely. And any of you that can visualise a prescription, it usually it can only have five on it. And now, in the olden days, one would give you one piece of paper. Now, it's, uh, it's not unusual to have five sheets of paper, 25 medicines. I beg you, it, it, people don't take them. If they do take them, the, the side effects all interact with each other and they stop working. It's a sort of pharmacological stew. It's nuts, isn't it? I remember when I was a GP a long time ago, um, uh, we had, uh, we, just for a laugh, I did an audit to find the woman on the most tablets in the practice. And she was on 28 tablets a day, including warfarin. And she was having her warfarin levels checked and they were going up and down like a bride's nighty. Um, and uh, we couldn't understand why. So I did a home visit and it turns out she got so confused taking 28 tablets a day Day, that at the beginning of the month she'd empty them all into one big basket, take out 28 at random each day. I figured it would even itself out in the end, Doctor. <laughs> but that's in essence what people do, well, isn't it? They it, just it, take yeah. any, oh, well, I'll take the blue ones, the pink one. Pink one clashes with my shoes, I'm not taking that one. I'll have that purple one, that's lovely. Or oh, the, little, the little yellow ones that I found backstage, which uh, I don't not know what mine, they Claire. are. They're not mine, Claire, they're not mine. But also, when you do home visits on people after they've died, pretty much the only time you get a home visit these days mm. uh, but there are buckets of blood pressure pills and stuff yeah. in the cupboard under the seat you get three carrier bags full of dead person's tablets don't you why yeah, is that no, well because I, I think patients feel that, that well, they'll offend us if they don't ask for repeat prescriptions and they sort of just hide it under the under the cupboard when Who? my mother died i went to see and she had packets and packets and packets of medication was it hrt cream <laughs> Some of it was. <laughs> Who would be happy taking a dead person's tablets? I mean, they don't come highly recommended, but... <laughs> If they weren't past their sell-by day, who would be happy taking somebody else's dead statins or... Say hi. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good. Yes. I particularly like this one. This one came from a GP in Lincolnshire. We should put up a notice in every waiting room saying, if you arrive clutching the Daily Mail health supplement, please be advised that the doctor or nurse 
reserves the right to roll it up, insert it gently into your anus and set light to it. <laughs> Those in favour say aye. They, they, they like, like that one. They, they like, like that one, one. yes, yes. How, where do you stand on the Daily Mail, oh, Claire? Oh, it's an amazing newspaper, <laughs> so supportive of GPs. It is, isn't it? I, I once had this uh, awful article written about me by somebody called Richard Littlejohn, as mm. many of you know him, and he called me a pig in a poke, oh. a two-bit politician, and that I sh- my father, who just died, should be ashamed of me for scaremongering around the, the Health and Social Care Act. So, uh, And then he claimed he was related to me, which is quite bizarre. Isn't that bizarre? Because you were my leader back then. You were chair of the Royal College of GPs, mm. and uh, inspired by you, I then went on Question Time, my one and only appearance on Question Time, waving the Health and Social Care Act to Andrew Lansley. Check it out if you want to see it. But I got a fraction of the hate that you got. Oh. You got loads of hate, but because I'm a privileged white bloke who writes for Private Eye, tiny bit of hate, you got loads. Oh, I get loads of hate. I got horrible. I was uh, had a picture of the Independent, put a picture of my home on the front page. Now, you know, normally they put the house and they'll say, you know, worth a million pounds or anything. They just put this home and it looked like a brothel and they didn't even put what it, what it cost. So obviously it was mm. uh, horrible in terms of what they thought. No, I got terrible there. Can I actually say I've been to Claire's home and it is a brothel? Um, <laughs> I got <laughs> this is the bit of the show I particularly like. Claire is five-star Gerada. A lot of people don't know this, but she also has a fabulous singing voice. Are we ready for this? Born outside the NHS, I was... Born outside the NHS. Oh, beautiful. So you were one of those pesky migrants coming over here running our public services. Yes, I was born in Africa. My parents were Maltese, so they moved to, to Nigeria. You know, and then I was born there, and then we came to the UK, where Dad worked for the NHS for 40 years as a GP, and I so admired him, I followed in his footsteps. So that's interesting. So two generations of people serving these bloody migrants coming over here, running our public <laughs> services. How have you felt when we've had a lot of awful stuff oh. recently, people throwing bricks at Filipino nurses? So they well, can't it's, go to work. it's been appalling, hasn't it? Because without immigrants, we wouldn't have the health and co- social care system that we have. So tell us. <laughs> but put some numbers on that, well, Claire. I mean, how, how many people, how many migrant workers are there in the NHS and care system? Around 60% of new registrants for, on the right. GMC are, are doctors trained overseas. Now, actually, that isn't entirely a good thing because we're taking them from countries that can ill afford them. But without immigrants, without the contribution of the Filipinos, the West Indians, all of these people, then actually the, the system would fall down. And it's down. not just the doctors and nurses, is no, it? No, it's it's every porters, level of the caterers, NHS. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So not only are we going to have a big round of applause to the migrant workers, we are going to show solidarity with them. Give them a massive, massive round of applause. <laughs> Now, do we have any nurses in the audience? Yeah, Uh, these suggestions come from Newcastle, so I'm just pre-warning you, uh, but they are about nurses, so here we go. Trigger warning. (laughs) Nurses nurses typically lift patients on the count of three. If they lifted them on the count of two, they could save 33% of their time (laughs) for other essential tasks. Those in favour say aye. Gosh. Who would like to hear another one from Newcastle pertaining to how to sort out the bed crisis? You ready? Okay. The bed crisis. Swap hospital beds for bunk beds. Bed crisis sorted. (laughs) Would that work? Final one on nurses, which is Claire's favourite. I think it's a bit distasteful, but she makes me read it out every show. A nurse's uniform typically costs over £100. However, you can buy one in Ann Summers for £19.99. And it's wiped down. And uh, I have actually been to Anne Summers. It's, it's just down on Princess Street, if anybody wants to go in. And you can actually buy a nurse's uniform. They're on special officer offer, and you can actually also get a men's nurse's uniform. Yes, and you said in previous shows you were going to buy us each a uniform for us yeah. to wear on our final performance, which is it. And where are they? Where is well, the Well, you uniform? said you'd wear your frilly underwear, and you haven't worn it, so... Claire doesn't wear any underwear <laughs> if you really want to. If we're going to start dishing dirt, Claire, I feel slightly sad that we're not going out in the nurse's uniform. We'll do that for a private party. Yes. Private party. Any patient who brings more than three problems to the doctor should also bring a bottle of Prosecco. Those in favour say aye. <laughs> so that's enough jokey jokey stuff, Claire. I want you now to read out this amazing leaflet that came through um, our window, not our window, our door, on the oh, 5th door. of July 1948. Uh, May have come through uh, the window. Even our letterbox. Letterbox is the thing. So uh, your new National Health Service begins on the 5th of July. What is it and what do you get? F- what is it? 
It will provide you with all medical, dental and nursing care. Everyone, rich or poor, man, woman or child, can use it or any part of it. There are no charges except for a few special items. There are no insurance qualifications, but it is not a charity. You are all paying for it, mainly as taxpayers, and it will relieve your money worries in time of illness. Isn't that lovely? That's wonderful, beautifully written. You would struggle. Any bollocks written by McKinsey or any of those management consultants since can't touch that. Who would like to recommit to those ideals and the welfare state? Say aye. aye. I'm glad you said that. Can we have the lights up, Wayne, please? So when you say you commit to the NHS and the welfare state, what you're saying is you would turn to a stranger in this audience, as we're going to do now. You're going to look them in the eye and you're going to say, I love you. <laughs> and when you get sick, you can have some of my money. Give it a go. Give it a go. <laughs> I love you, you, and when you get sick, sick you can have some of my money. Some of my money. Thank you. <laughs> now, what we're now saying, what Claire and I are arguing is we move to a more preventative model. We have to move upstream. Instead of pulling people out of the river of shit, we have to wander upstream and stop them falling in. So now, I want you to turn to a stranger, uh, look them in the eye and say, I love you, and let's put our minds and money together to stop us getting sick in the first place. I, I love you, you. <laughs> and let's put, put our, our minds and money, money together, together to stop us getting, getting sick in, in the first place. place. Have you seen my underpants as well? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is it. That is our final show just finished. You can take away a poster if you want to because we sold out. Ha! Huh, we've stopped putting posters up. But if you want to take a free poster and commit to Doctors in Distress, make a donation, you can. I've been very moved coming to this show. Dame Claire Gerard at 60-something has done her Edinburgh Fringe <laughs> debut and it's just been an absolute oh. joy. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Right. And thank you, Phil. Here we go. Uh, we're bang on now, uh, so uh, the best way for you uh, to uh, look after yourself uh, and look after each other is to come to my other show, The Ins and Outs of Pleasure, which has about 20 tickets left. We'd be nice to see you there, but it's been a wonderful Edinburgh Fringe run. Thank you, Claire. Thank you thank all you. for coming. And thank you, Wayne. Good times. Thank you, Wayne, up in the box. Give Wayne a big round of applause. Take care. Lots of and work. if you feel brave, I want you to stand up now and do a goblet squat with uh, Claire and I. <laughs> If some air comes out of the upstroke, don't worry, that's perfectly normal. Bloody hell, that's good. That's yeah. nice and tight. That's nice and tight. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye. Bye. That's it. Have a good night.